Can we now invite our second speaker, Dr. Arun sir, MBS, DNB, Pediatrics, DM Gastronomy. A small in your answer. Dr. N. Aaron, DNB Pediatrics, DM Gastroenterology, Education, DM Medical Gastroenterology, Stanley Medical College, Chennai 2015 to 2018, DMB Pediatrics, Indira Gandhi Government, General Hospital and Postgraduate Institute, Puducherry 2008 to 2011, MBBS, Raja Mathaya Medical College, Animalai University, Chittenborough. 2000 to 2006, work history, one visiting consultant gastroenterologist, hepatologist, and interventional endoscopist, Menkadeeswara Hospitals, Chandra's Road, Nandanam, Chennai, two Chandra Gastra, Liver and Endoscopic Center Set, 2019 to till date, consultant gastroenterologist, hepatologist, and interventional endoscopist, Chennai, three assistant professor of, 2018 to of, 2019, medical gastroenterology, Rajiv Gandhi Government General Hospital, Chennai, four senior resident, eight minutes, 2017 to seven minutes, 2018, Department of Medical Gastroenterology, Stanley Medical College, Chennai, Tamil Nadu, five junior resident, eight minutes, 2015 to seven minutes, 2017, Department of Medical Gastroenterology, Stanley Medical College, Chennai, Tamil Nadu, six senior resident, six minutes, 2012 to seven minutes, 2015, Kanchai Kamakoti Child Trust Hospital, Chennai, Tamil Nadu, 7 senior resident, 7 minutes 2011 to 5 minutes 2012, Indira Gandhi Gov, General Hospital and PGI, Puducherry, 8 consultant gastroenterologists, hepatologists, and interventional endoscopists, Apollo Main Hospitals, Greens Road, Chennai, Accomplishments, Original Research Article and Abstracts and Posters in National and International Level, Conferences and Seminars, Presented Many Cases in State Conference, Attended World Congress of Endoscopy. Presented many nationalized talk and webinars and state and national talks. Affiliations. Life member in Indian Society of Gastroenterology. Life member in INASL. Life member in SGES. Life member in IAP. Life member in IJPP. Skills. Expert in all invasive and non-invasive procedures in gastroenterology. Dedicated to excellence. Good clinical judgment. Humane and respectful. Calm under pressure. Medical research comprehension. Strong interpersonal skills. Peer support. And over the center, you said. Thank you, Dr. Zubai, for your fantastic lecture. And uh, respected professors, senior consultants, and my dear friends, it's been really a great pleasure for me to be in this wonderful gathering on this Sunday. Uh, I would like to thank Team IMA Metro who gave me an opportunity to share some knowledge and inspect what's happening in the field of gastroenterology regarding management of gastroesophageal reflux and aseptic disorder. See, this is very, very common scenario what we are executing in day two I and mean, every day's life. Even physician, surgeon, gastroenterologist, everybody will be experiencing this kind of presentation and you are not going to leave your OP practice without this kind of event. To discuss about this, we should know the basic definition. As we all know, gastroesophageal reflux, any contents, if it is going to get reflexate from your gastric region into your esophageal tract, there's nothing but your gastroesophageal reflux, and based upon your classification, what is known as Montreal's. What always is going to happen, once a patient is going to exhibit, see, if you're going to look into the data in Indian scenario, almost around 9 to 20 percent of the population will be experiencing and the prevalence will be more common in Europe and US and compared to your Indian scenario because of the diet and lifestyle pattern. And to whom the patient is going to seek a gastroenterologist opinion. So initially the patient will be considering will be consulting with the basic physician and practitioner followed by uh, even in the tip of eyes, but the still remains uncommon because as the patient scenario is not going to improve with your BPI and it's on all those medications followed by once the patient is going to not adhere to the medication for longer duration and this kind of patient is going to seek a gastroenterologist for further management and it's always remains a tip of iceberg and once the patient is going to develop a chronic and persistent symptoms and complication that's the area you need to refer to the gastroenterologist promptly and in OP practice, 40% of monthly visits and 20% of weekly and 4 to 7% of daily visits will be because of your GERD and reflux. 
So we should not forget any patients, even with atypical chest pain, as we have been discussed in the previous speaker. So the various causes of chest pain, on one common scenario, we are not supposed to forget is our gastroesophageal reflux because that is very commonly we are encountering. And most of the time, when you are going to treat a patient within a span of time, even after stopping the medication, the patient will be bounced back again with this kind of event. So how are you going to how are you going to assess? How are you going to manage? What is the dose and what power uh, to whom you are going to refer? How is this patient? going to get intervened with the light diet and lifestyle modification is the most important thing for me to address here before over a period of next 30 minutes. As you all know, to briefly, uh, my intention when we are going to wind up the session, we need to know something about what is happening in gastroesophageal reflux. So the basic pathophysiology, how are you going to approach and how to diagnose, how are you going to investigate, followed by what is the basic lifestyle modification and treatment, what are the new approaches being tried in the field of gastroenterology when you are going to manage a patient with gastroesophageal reflux disease. So the four basic mechanisms is one by your esophageal tract and one by your low esophageal sphincter competence and one by your gastric emptying. So the low esophageal sphincter competence has to be well augmented if you want to prevent. So this is a basic outline of your pathophysiology, what is happening in your GERD. See, Starting from head to foot, starting, starting from the salivary function, if it is going to get impact, if your esophageal clearance, if it is going to get impact, followed by the patient is going to have iodosenia. As you all know, iodosenia is very, very common scenario. If the patient is going to have obese and sedentary lifestyle, so these are all the patients will be having common scenario of iodosenia, in which there is various grading. There is grading one, two, three. Is, uh, so once the patient is going to have iodosenia, if the PLAC, if the inappropriate relaxation of your transit, I mean, uh, low esophageal sphincter and various acids, your gastric acid and your pyloric incompetency, one is because of your pyloric incompetence, urinary incompetence, and esophageal mucosal defense. Everything, if it is going to get impact and your reduced resting pressure of the LES, it is not going to get augmented properly, and that's the area for your patho, uh, that's the area for your reflexate events to take on. The main thing, the four major mechanism is your LES competence, that works by your TLACR and your swallow induced relaxation, your hypotensive low esophageal sphincter, as well as your iodosenia. So what is this LES, transient low esophageal sphincter? So our intention, we need to reduce the sphincter relaxation, only then we can able to prevent the reflux. So if the sphincter relaxation, if it is going to get augmented for a period of more than 10 seconds, and if the 50 to 80 percent of the reflux events is going to get involved because of this, because of mechanism of belching, your vagal receptor, your stress receptors, all those things, if it is going to get stimulated, that's the area uh, that is high prominent for the patient to land with reflex and you are going to take a swallow the swallow induced relaxation once your hypotensive lower esophageal sphincter is going to get augmented and the iatosenia so what I've been discussed with you these are all the various areas of your common presentation the most common symptoms is heartburn and regurgitation. Most of the patients, around 70 to 80 percent of the population, once they're being going to land with evidence of GRE, uh, they're going to have this common scenario. But usually, it usually occurs shortly after eating and can last for a few minutes to hours. The patient may worsen with swallowing. See, this is the basic classification of your GERD. Always you should remember that not only because of your esophageal symptom, also your extra esophageal symptom has to be analyzed because both of them is going to carry out with a common innervation arc. And esophageal symptom is nothing but your typical reflux and your esophagitis and all those things and your extra esophageal based upon your extra GSOs like cough, laryngitis, asthma, pharyngitis, sinusitis. There are so many etiological, etiological other triggers to be looked into that. And basic diagnosis. See, how are you going to diagnose this GI? See, there are patients to whom you are going to refer, how are you going to diagnose? So at what point of time this patient has to be prompted? Are barium swallow, is there going to have any use? Not much of role for barium swallow nowadays, except for evidence of achalasia or some other things that what have been previous speaker been discussed. That's the area you can try. Apart from that, I identify your predominant role of GERD with barium solo, not, not much of concern nowadays. Endoscopy definitely having a significant role and pH monitoring, that's one of the very important potential investigation. And esophageal manometry, once you're going to diagnose your motility, your neuromotility disorder, once a patient is going to land with achalasia and various other based upon your modified Chicago classification is what happening. So there are a huge list of that, it's a motility based disorder. At that point of time, you can consider for esophageal manometry because in that area also, the patient may land with evidence of GERD. And any patient, when you are going to refer to a gastroenterologist with this kind of presentation, only is the red, the red mark signs.
in the heart rate. Uh, flat signs you're not supposed to forget any dysphagia or anaphagia is very common indicator to refer promptly to endoscopic evaluation and significant weight loss if it is going to be more than five to ten percentage and once the patient is going to have evidence of GA bleed or anemia or mass or stricture or ulcer if you are going to be diagnosed so always peptic ulcer disease we are not supposed to forget peptic ulcer and GERD will always go together because peptic ulcer the area of treatment is entirely different and even then we are going to put the patient on PPI it doesn't mean the peptic is going to get a off. So GERD and peptic also is a different entity that should be addressed in proper way. And you need to screen yourself for barrels esophagitis. Barrels esophagus, that's one important thing in which you have been esophageal squamous epithelium. If it is going to get replaced by your columnar mucus of your stomach, there is high potential for you to develop evidence of adenocarcinoma as a day progresses. So in case the patient is going to land up with persistent vomiting, these are all the various red flag signs that we are not supposed to forget. These are the patients to be promptly referred to an endoscopic evaluation. But upper GA endoscopy, we need to have evidence of alternative diagnosis. For example, your esophagitis is grading is there. For Barrett's esophagus is very important for in case to identify your peptic stricture. Once the patient is going to land up with evidence of peptic stricture, it could be see so you should not forget there are two etiological focus for stricture. One is because of benign stricture and one is because of malignant stricture. So benign stricture, the basic common etiological factor in Indian scenario will be always mainly because of peptic. So peptic stricture, the various modalities of treatment are available. You can go for steroids, you can go for dilatation, various dilatation procedures in which nowadays there are strength and other modalities have been developed. So and low grade esophagitis, that's also another indicator for which we need to look into that. Endoscopy. And based upon your endoscopy, you need to classify the patient as non-erosive and erosion is if it is there or not. Because every time when you are going to see a patient with evidence of endoscopic events, most of the time the patient may be having evidence of distal esophagitis or anteral erosions. So distal esophagitis means we need to categorize the patient with grading as per your Los Angeles classification. And even if the endoscopic reports are absolutely fine, doesn't mean the patient does not have any evidence of gastroesophageal reflux because non-erosive reflux disease is very common in Indian scenario that we are not supposed to forget more than 60% of the population mainly by your NERA. And this is the basic classification for a gastroenter that we are supposed to forget. When you're going to look in your endoscopic picture, the first imaging, always the very common one single mucosal break, what is called as Los Angeles grade A, if it is going to less than 5 mm. And if it is going to be more than 5 mm, that means the patient is going to be in Los Angeles grade B. And if it is going to involve a circumference, but not more than 75% is Los Angeles grade C. And but if it is going to be extensively involved, which means multiple erosion, which is going to happen in the esophagus, that means Los Angeles grade 3 and grade D. Why we need to assess this grading is very important because based upon the grading, we need to treat the patient to which medication we need to start and how long we need to give, how it is going to follow. These are the various indicators for which the basic endoscopic evaluation for a patient who presents to us in the background of GERD is very, very important. And esophageal biopsy not absolutely indicated. Once esophageal biopsy, when you are going to suspect any evidence of carcinoma, there is absolute indication. But even then, if you are going to put the patient on, I mean PPI, the patient might be having evidence of refractory GERD. There are a huge list of causes for refractory GERD is there that I'll be taking over in the upcoming slide. But once a patient is going to have refractory GERD, if you are going to suspect evidence of eosinophilic esophagitis, because this eosinophilic disorders right from your oral cavity into your anal canal, it's been frequently encountered nowadays. So we need to, we should not forget, not all patients who presents to us or think uh, to think only in terms, uh, terms of uh, um, in, uh, gastroesophageal reflux. It could be because of eosinophilic esophagitis, for which we need to look into a biopsy to look for evidence of eosinophilia and all those things. And uh, based upon your atopy, your skin, all those uh, I mean, dermatology manifestations, your, uh, apart from your colitic presentation, all those pointers to be taken into account if you want to diagnose esophageal disorders. And esophageal manometry, nothing, no major role to diagnose esophageal in uh, uh, this one, uh, GERD, but you can try uh, because whenever you're going to plan the patient for any anti reflex surgical procedures, at that point of time, there is a role for esophageal manometry. This one potential impedance pH monitoring is important 24 hours. You can you can do it by a catheter based or you can do it by a Bravo capsule. There are so many modalities are there. And nowadays impedance combined uh, impedance monitoring is there. So what we are going to do, we need to place a catheter into the lower ASFG junction in which we are going to assess how far the reflex even is going to get happened. 
So there are various scoring systems and what we are going to call as d Mises score in which the always we need to see if the score, if it is, uh, see, always our, our main intention when you are going to treat a patient with GERE, uh, we need to maintain a pH should be, gastric pH has to be elevated more than 4. So how much of time if the pH is going to remain less than 4, that's one of the most important thing we need to assess by your uh, d Mises scoring. If it is going to be more than 14, that's strong point of for you to consider the reflex if it is happening or not. Because based upon your esophageal I mean, uh, impedance monitoring, you can able to identify whether the patient is having a worsening of event or non-worsening event, whether the patient is going to have a proven GERD or unproven GERD. If you're going to look into this slide, see once you're doing upper GI endoscopy with atypical symptoms or all those things, at that point of time, what you're going to do, you need to do a catheter-based or wireless pH monitoring or 24 hours impedance pH monitoring. Either you need to subject the patient with PPA therapy or off PPA therapy for a duration of one week to assess whether the patient is responding or not. And based upon that, we need to calculate your total acid exposure time. This is very, very important when you're going to look into your uh, pH monitoring. And acid exposure, if it is going to be more than six, is always uh, inconsistent with GER. If it is going to be less than 4, possibility of normalcy will be there. And number of reflex episodes is if it is going to be more than 80, it's abnormal. So more than 6 and more than 80 of reflex, we should not forget based upon your manometric, I mean, uh, based upon your esophageal, uh, uh, your scoring system, pH metric system. So based upon that, AAT more than 6 and reflex more than 80% is always considered abnormal. And multi-channel luminal impedance in which we can use this system also because see uh, as we all know the reflexive will happen not only in liquid even in gaseous state or semi-solid state. So even in various state you can able to identify based upon this multi-channel intraluminal impedance. The sensitivity is almost going approximately around 70 to 100 percentage. So even for the forward flow and even for the anti-grade flow of your reflex and it can able to identify the height of your reflex and based upon that, uh, even in non-reflex episodes can be useful to identify and this modality, combined modality can be tried. And nowadays no need to pay a clatheter, you can try with your Bravo pH capsule metry in which what you are going to do, this is wireless radio telemetry probe, what we are going to do, you need to place a capsule just 5 cm now <coughs> your OG junction in which if you are going to identify with that, uh, you can able to identify the signal but it's very easy, not much of difficulty but uh, even though if you have, there is the only main problem for this kind of patients, you need to wait for a duration of almost around 48 hours. And in case if you are going to remove within a span of around 24 hours, you couldn't be able to document the period of reflex, how much of events is happening. And the main area for us to discuss today is GERD management because GERD management day in and day out will be having more, more, more common doubts. Any patient gastroesophageal reflex as per American ACG guidelines, the first and foremost thing, lifestyle modification. Lifestyle modification, as we are well known, frequent small meal and avoidance of high carbohydrate, high fatty meal. And apart from that, you need to sleep in spine, I mean uh, left lateral or not to be in prone position and diet and physical activity at least four to six hours in a day. But once you're going to take out with your diet and lifestyle modifications, doesn't mean your reflex is going to get prevented. Because even with your diet, even with your lifestyle modification, there is high possibility for this kind of patients to develop your reflex that as per various papers and various evidence is there to go. But even with that, our diet and lifestyle modification has to set the primary aim to target the patient with uh, uh, improving your reflex episode. Because once a patient is going to have a high obesity in which and at that point of scenario, your cytokine levels is going to go high and at that point of scenario, there might be evidence of your LE special which is going to get augmented and that there is high possibility for this prior patients to land up with worsening of GERD. So diet, lifestyle is one important thing and followed by the basic medications, if it is not responding, stepping up and stepping down and finally we can go for surgical intervention or endoscopic advanced kind of modalities of treatment. So basically, we need to start with the patient with single dose PPI. If it is not responding, we can go with the double dose PPI therapy. And even then, if the patient is not going to show any evidence of response over a period of 8 to 12 weeks of duration, we need to consider this patient as refractory GERD. Refractory GERD is one separate area that will be discussed in a separate forum because it's a such complex scenario. So many ideological factors are there to assess your refractory GERD. But to brush up our knowledge about the basic symptoms, 
First, we need to do the upper endoscopy to identify any evidence of any specific focus like eosophilic esophagitis or any erosive esophagitis as per that. And once the patient doesn't have any evidence of typical symptoms, you need to focus on your atypical symptoms. And if you are having any suspicion or event of respiratory, your ENT, all those things should be analyzed. And we need to do a pretest probability based upon on medications or off medications based upon your impedance pH monitoring. And you can able to identify the reflex events as what I will discuss with you based upon your acid exposure time and based upon your DMH scoring. And the basic thing, lifestyle modeling, this one thing we're not supposed to forget. Your lifestyle will be taking care of around 20%. Your H2 receptors will be going to take on around 50%. And your PPA of single dose will be around 80. And your double dose, increased dose of PPA, that might be evidence of around 90. But some papers, they are calling even up to 100% so responses there. But still, it's a questionable issue to be addressed more. So as uh, so basically I told you, so always try to sleep in the left lateral position and avoid sleeping within a short period of time, avoid nap in afternoon hours and uh, you need to complete your meal by around 7 to 7.30 at night, you need to go to bed around 10 to 10.30, smoking, alcohol, all those things, cessation, because these are all the things will worsen your TLACR yeah? at the point of time the patient will exhibit more and more reflux. So OTC medication never always avoid, that's one of the most important things we need to counsel. And view list of medications, they, you, we all well know about the basic medications, antacids just to brush up. The problem is we need to use frequent dosing. The basic mechanism is when you are going to use an alginate preparation, what is it going to do? It is going to form a wrap. It is going to form a wrap inside your acid pocket, which is going to happen in your parietal cell. And once the patient is going to get the acid, I mean, uh, uh, wrap formation is going to get established at that point of time, uh, your reflex events is going to get controlled. But the problem with your antacid, various preparation like aluminum, I mean, aluminum and magnesium preparations are there, in which you may land up with evidence of constipation, and some patients will have evidence of diarrhea, osteoporosis, osteomalacia, other complications are there. But it is not going to heal up your reflex. I mean, uh, once the patient is going to diagnose with esophagitis, and at that point of time, you are going to use this I mean, antacids. There is no potential role and it is not going to respond because the healing of mucosa is not going to happen with your antacid. So mucosal healing means we need to consider your H2 receptors or we need to consider your PPA. That's very, very important. PPA definitely is having a high potential role, but the problem with PPA, there are more adverse events nowadays, more more papers are being done, even for the cardiac events also. The H2 receptors, main thing is the huge molecules are there. Nowadays, the one common molecule, what we are trying is lafotidin, 10 milligrams H2. Or some papers, even we can go up to twice those regimen can be tried morning. But when you're going to use H2 blockers, always we should not forget it is going to inhibit your nocturnal acid breakthrough. This is very, very important because when you're going to use your PPA in the morning, it is going to act for a period of around 12 to 24 hours. At that point of time, in night time, some patient may have worsening of reflex. The reflex may start off. So what we're supposed to do, you need to give a H2 blockers in night time to prevent that nocturnal acid breakthrough. But the problem with your H2 receptor antagonism is mainly it can evidence it can show evidence of tachyphylaxis, which means once a patient is going to give a consecutive dosing for a longer duration of time, the response rate is going to come, come down. So tachyphylaxis is one common demerit of your H2 receptor antibodies that we are not supposed to forget, but it is very, very safe to use. The one problem is for grade 3 and 4 esophagitis, the response with your H2 receptor antibodies will not be very high or will not be very potential when compared to your grade 1 and 2. So, and but the one common event is when compared to your other molecules of cardiac drugs, so the interaction with your cardiac molecules will be very less rather than reversing in already been removed from the market, not much of use nowadays. But nocturnal acid breakthrough to prevent esophagitis over a duration of time without major adverse events, always we need to consider H2 blockers. That is one safe molecule for even for the most complicated scenario to be considered when you are going to manage, but not in the presentation of UGA bleed or any massive, any other complications. Only if you are diagnosing with minimal reflex it is safely you can use. And various side effects as we are well known like your headache and all those things and drug interactions is mainly by your COAPP 450 pathway and the most important area for take on, to take on here is proton pump. See what is this proton pump? This is the what say it's a cell which is going to be located in your parietal cell. 
the main area of proton pump inhibitor the mechanism of action is going to irreversibly inhibit your hydrogen potassium ATP. So the hydrogen level is going to, so what is going to happen, it takes a non-acidic potassium ion out of the stomach and replaces with hydrogen. That's the role of your proton pump. So what is going to happen, we need to reduce hydrogen ions and we need to create with the, uh, in order to avoid that, we need to block this H2 for hydrogen potassium ATP is possible. That's the main area, it is going to irreversibly inhibit. So once the patient is going to subject with PPI, the other new pockets to get formed, it will take minimum 12 to 24 hours. That's the area, so we need to think that. So that's why the increased duration of regimen. Now that's why the sustained release preparation nowadays is there in the market and your extended release, your double dose regimen has been already been there. So in which the initial level of pH, may, I mean, it will always produce a gastric pH of less than 4. So initial reduction will be there and followed by a consecutive reduction over 4 to 5 hours and initial reduction within a period of around 60 minutes to 90 minutes you can establish. So it can produce a sustained actually the various molecules, for example your dexlanzoprazole and your illoprazole, all those things we are going to consider. So the double uh, dose mechanism of action has been well augmented nowadays we are going to use your PPI. And these are all the common pathways, we are not supposed to forget that your gastrin, your ACH pathway, all those things is going to stimulate your parietal cell and that's the area your hydrogen ions is not going to get activated followed by once a patient is going to retain this, the hydrogen potassium ATP is blocker mainly because of PPI which is going to be taken on with us. And your list of molecules, right now the latest one is Dexlanzo, Elaprazole, many other things is going there. Even other newer molecules being tried. But double dose PPI we can consider for stepping up of therapy. And this is the basic thing we should not forget, step up and step down. Start with your H2 receptors and PPI on demand and lower dose of PPI and you can go up to your double dose of PPI. The merits already have been discussed with you all is we need to maintain a gastric pH of more than 4 for around 10 to 14 hours daily. The main problem is so when you are going to use your PPA for longer duration of time the nocturnal acid breakthrough the efficacy will not be much because as what I have been discussed with you in order to prevent that we need to add H2 receptors and so many other adverse events like your maze, major active coronary events, may, most of the papers are being reported. Once a patient is going to subject with clopidogrel and other molecules at that point of time, based upon your COP450 pathway, if it is going to act by your omeprazole and all those things, you are going to subject at that point, the patient may have worsening of events. We don't know how far it is going to act. So the major active coronary events are being well augmented by this PPI. So we need to assess to whom you are going to use, what are the various presentations, head to foot examination, what are the coexisting complications, comorbid presentation, all those things you need to assess before starting the patient on PPI. Just like that starting a patient on PPI doesn't going to deserve anything, you are going to be in no man's land most of the time. And as once a patient been initiated with PPI, we need to give a duration of 8 to 12 weeks of minimum duration, followed by we need to assess with the success successive either by endoscopic assessment or by clinical response whether it is going to happen or not. And the main role, the demerit is not going to prevent your weak reflexes, your alkaline reflexes, your duodenal reflexes, all those things is not going to have much of potential role. Apart from that, new list of side effects is there like I well know now various papers being coding with that, your acute kidney, acute kidney injury is being well proven, even for your chronic kidney disease some papers. Now we should not forget any liver patient, for example, the common things as we all in your practice, who might be coming with alcoholic liver disease. Once a patient is going to have evidence of alcoholic liver and at that, at that point of time, if you are going to use PPI, that might be having evidence of worsening of your PAMP and DAM. What is a PAMP and DAM? Nothing but your pathogen pattern as well as your damage pattern. Once if it is going to get augmented, at that point, the patient may have worsening of your ascites. The patient may have worsening of your spontaneous battery peritonitis. There is the area you are going to make a florid growth of your septicemia and other things to take on. So always, any liver patient, be very cautious when you are going to use your PPIs. And when you are going to use PPI for longer duration, the patient may have funding gland, polyp and funding gland, hypoplasia, all those things. And you may develop B12 deficiency, osteoporosis, iron mold. All of these are theoretical purpose. But why I should point out that there are new list of adverse events for cardiac, your gastric, as well as your hepatic, as well as your uh, uh, renal potential is there. So be very cautious when you are going to use your PPI and never consider uh, this is a potential molecule just like the initial. Among various PPI, the two major things, Raviprozole and Esamiprozole can be considered. For major active coronary events, Raviprozole is slightly having more potential because of COAP 
four five zero pathway is not be well augmented with that. And next to that, your SME puzzle will be the second potential line. But your renal injury and all SME puzzle can be safely considered. And once the patient, this is being taken from the recent paper of uh, ACG guidance, what they mentioned is that once you are going to start the patient with PPI, all the areas is going to get respond when compared to placebo. Your heartburn, your esophagitis, your cardiac chest pain, and on cardiac events, all those things are going to get uh, respond very well. And these are all the various papers to call the beneficial role of your PPIs. And next to that, the basic thing is prokinetic. Always you will be subjecting any PPI with your prokinetic. So prokinetic in order to augment your lower esophageal sphincter tone and in order to promote your gastric intake. Various prokinetics among them, the best one is always etoprite. When compared to other things, in my personal experience, next to that will be sinitoprite. Because etoprite will be D2 antagonist, nastoprenase to inhibitor, apart from sinitoprite will be agonist of 5H2, 1H3, H3, 4 but commonly we will be using only domperidone to be the safer side. But why the problem is uh, uh, happening because a huge list of demerits are there. For example, if you are going to use metaclopramide, dentin barrier crossing, and domperidone also might be having some evidence of hyperprolactin and other complications. So once you need to be very cautious. And if any patient is going to have evidence of irritable bowel, because most of the patient with GARD will be having functional GA disorder as per your own criteria. That might be evidence of IBS. At that point of time, you are going to subject with PPA and prokinetic. I have seen multiple patients that now experience because with that, the patient will have further worsening of events. So we don't know whether it is because of IBS per se or whether it is because of your drug, what is the thing which is going to get involved. So always you need to be very, very cautious when you are going to subject a patient with PPI along with your prokinetic. And there are some other drugs that definitely you are going to have, you will be seeing most of the patients will be having high level of hiccups at that point of presentation in order to improve, in order to TLC, in order to control down your TLC, we can use baclofen, GABA B agonist at a dose of around 5 to 20 milligram in order to decrease it, it's going to come when we decrease your acid as well as a dual reflex. These are all the drugs can be tried for a period of around 4 weeks of duration but there are major adverse events like drowsiness, dizziness, all those things can report. Refractory GERD, I have told you many uh, previously. Uh, initial paper, what they mentioned, at least 8 weeks, but there are some new papers what they are giving at least of 12 weeks of therapy. Double dose PPA, 12 weeks, no response, even with good adherence, with lifestyle modification, refractory GERD, look for other causes. It could be because of reflux esophagitis, NERE, or it could be because of your uh, functional or burn or it could be because of hypersensitivity, is a figures, all those things might be there. Uh, so many things to be considered and newer molecules when you are going to see is by your H2 receptor that what I have been discussed to prevent your NAB. That is nothing but your nocturnal acid breakthrough and next to that your potassium blockers. That is nothing but oneprazone can be tried. Oneprazone in management, newer molecule being tried in India but still we need more papers to augment in day to day practice. Onaprazone, Rivaprazone, now even Tegaprazone is being launched few um, um, and been in trial few months before. But these are all the molecules. See, what is going to happen? It is going to block your uh, competing with potassium. It's going to I mean, reversibly it is going to innervate your hydrogen potassium ATP. It's not irreversibly inhibition. But when compared to your esophagitis, your uh, loss age is great. C and D is going to heal very well with your Onaprazone. So these are all the molecules in pipeline. In which if you are going to consider managing a patient with GERD as the day progresses probably it might be taking on with further thing. But always we should not forget antidepressants definitely having a potential role because functional GA disorder one very complex event even for the gastrointestinal tract. So antidepressant to whom to consider when you are going to subject based upon the CNS assessment scale and all those things we need to consider to some extent and if you want the patient mainly based upon your SSRI, your TCA and some papers have been given with evidence of flu and other support but mainly antidepressants that might be having some potential role when you are going to manage a patient with the GERD who is going to have a refractory presentation and these are all the various newer drugs being considered macrolides, even erythromycin, azithromycin being tried and your pain modulators, so many other new molecules being considered nothing much to discuss here one few important thing before winding up this discussion is what are the other new innovations being happened as of now in your endoscopy? One thing is various endoscopic approaches, not only for your uh, gastroesophageal, because 
the innovation in the field of gas filtering has been gone very high for your, for example your endoscopic ultrasound for example in your bariatric procedures for example in your GERD procedures so many innovations has happened and right now in even main Apollo we have been seeing many patients with this and some patients we have been trying with this kind of modalities, modalities of management to treat and based upon that various modalities are there one is by your radio frequency ablation by strata this allows the patient to subject once their pH metry is to be proven, refractory GERD has been identified. Even with that, the patient's clinical scenario is not going to respond. At that point of time, you can subject this patient with this kind of management. One is by strata and transoral fundoplication procedure like your ESFX. No need for any surgical intervention. The role of surgical intervention in gastroenterology has come down mostly because of this endoscopic intervention has taken or taken on very high. And, and along with that, ESFX, MUSC, and GE GERDEX procedure, and anti reflex mucosity. There are various just to brush up your knowledge with that. See, this is what is going to do the strata. So, you need to ablate with your radio frequency current. What you're going to use, you need to ablate your ESFX and mucosa uh, using a mucolytic and all those things. And we need to position, inflate your balloon, followed by at the point of time. Your strata, your esophageal, uh, the TLCI is going to be well maintained. So that's the area to produce your uh, radio frequency ablation line of treatment. There are various side effects for that that I'm not interested to discuss here, but you should not remember any GI procedures. There might be evidence of bleeding, there might be evidence of chest pain, there might be evidence of perforation. For all the procedures, we should not forget this common scenario. But for radio frequency ablation, the risk is very, very less. This is another one, but not much of use nowadays. This bot endocension niche. What we are going to do, we are going to placate in the lesser curvature just beneath the Z line, in which we are going to apply a placator. So, nothing much of use now. And ease of fix can be considered as nothing but a transoral incisionless fundoplication. So, what we are going to do with this instrument, we are going to apply. Uh, instead of going for a surgical fundoplication procedure and we need to augment, see, see we need to control your low ease picture by your isofix mechanism and this other one is by Gerdex that recently when what I've been, uh, I've gone to AG Institute of uh, in Hyderabad so we had a demonstration, a hands-on session for this Gerdex procedure so what we are going to use to do this but the cost of this procedure in India as of now is around 3.5 to 4 lakhs that's the problem is to invest and apart from that, we need to apply the placator, we need to open the arms, we need to fix the tissue. This is what is called as, uh, see if you are going to see around the OG junction, just beneath the lesser curve, we need to apply the elix. So what we are going to place, multiple placators we need to apply followed by this kind of plasma management. So we need to, uh, mainly in the greater curvature, we need to apply this placator in order to prevent your reflex events. And various injectable materials have been tried, but not much of happenings nowadays in India. But your, uh, you can try any biopolymers, your polymethyl acrylate. There are so many things are there out of discussion. But you should not forget these are all the various modalities. And one more thing is your stapler. You can apply your surgical endoscapler by your medigus, that's what's called as MUSE modality for your uh, partial anti fundoplication procedure and various injectable materials and uh, and this is very important procedure now has been tried based upon your endoscopic injection therapy what is called as arms anti-reflex mucosectomy so what we are going to do in this so lapis, I mean, uh, what we are going to in this what we are going to do uh, the application of snail or the mucosa submucosal injection of saline is going to be done and your complete resection of your esophageal, low esophageal junction mucosa is going to get happened and followed by your mucosectomy procedure is going to get complete. So that is how you need to prevent your anti any patients, possibility of bleeding, perforation, risk are there. Links, what you are going to do, you are going to place a magnetic bridge. This is a OG junction. See, you are going to place a circular ring, what is called as a links. So once you are going to place a circular ring, the reflex is going to come down. But this is all not much of based upon your magnetic attraction. Not much of papers to prove that, but these all the areas we tried. Fundoplication, well known, the most common is Nissan's, apart from the anterior as response to wrap. So, why I would like to point out today is see, if you want to manage a patient with GRD, the first and foremost, assess, refer the patient promptly, functional outburn, esophagitis, all those things, and refractory GRD, you list of causes for esophagitis and other things to be assessed promptly 
and diet and lifestyle modification starting from your step down as well as step up approach and with this counseling the patient on diet along with alcohol cessation smoking supplements and abstinence of smoking along with basic modalities of your ppi uh, monitoring the dose of ppa and uh, endoscopic observation therapy and all those things to be done in a prompt way to overcome this complication successfully with this i'm happy to rest the presentation thank you all for patient listening any doubts any questions to clarify anyone The radio frequency ablation, ma'am, is very very safe procedure for most of the uh, things in gastroenterology because, as we all know, radio frequency ablation we are using very commonly for certain conditions in India. That is only for some cases of your solitary rectal ulcer. I mean, mainly in some cases of uh, uh, post radiation induced proctitis. So once a patient, uh, for example, any patient who is having serious cervix. Who is that followed by radiotherapy? The patient may develop proctitis. At that point of time, we are going for your uh, APC coagulation, all those things. Like that, the radio frequency ablation has been recently well approved in India, but the risk events has been very, very less when compared to other modalities. So, chances of bleeding, perforation will definitely be very, very less when compared to other modalities of treatment like your application of stapler, your mules, and girders, and other procedures. Fungal esophagitis is a wrong common seed, not only for anything, apart from any esophagitis, it could be pill induced esophagitis, it could be infective esophagitis. The common scenario will be because of your infective esophagitis, among the viral will be more common. In fungus, we are going to look, as we are seeing, based upon your candida. That's very, very important because candida is one common scenario if the patient is immunocompromised. For example, in diabetic scenario, we have a frequently experienced that once a patient is going to land up with this kind of thing, so the patient will have severe autophagia. So for grading that, we will be using staging what is called as code C grading, K O D S I. So what they will see based upon your velvety mucosa, how far it is going to get involved. So stage one, two, three, four. If it is complete velvety mucosa, if you are going to look into Google and things, you can able to see that. So complete velvety mucosa means the patient is having grade four. At that point of time, some patient may deserve, I um, mean, in injective line of treatment, and some patient we can go for fluconazole for a duration of almost around two weeks. At least at a dose of around 150 milligrams uh, when you're going to subject. But fungal esophagitis, common as candida, and viral epic simplex, you're not supposed to forget. And other viral events, even nowadays, even post COVID scenario, some patients be different with the esophagitis. But we are not very sure because these are all the things that it's been predisposing or not. But based upon the common, common clinical investigation and basic profile, what is there we need to treat? Fungal esophagitis can only identify. Scopy cell and oral fungus ulcer will be present. See, oral, see, you can do, see, without scopy, no diagnosis. See, even if you are going to prove by oral, we need to show evidence in endoscopy. So, without endoscopy, if endoscopy, everything is fine, doesn't mean the patient is having evidence of oral lesion, doesn't mean the patient is going to have same presentation in esophagus. Because, uh, once, see, we have been seeing more patients nowadays with corrosive poisoning. Two days before I have seen a young girl who comes in corrosive, and uh, another patient, few days before I have seen, who met with RTA. Just like they born probably because of alcohol or something else, they uh, male around almost some 40 years of age. He had an injury of higher bone. The higher bone just been fractured and being avoided by any other consultant. They asked me for endoscopy at risk I would take So in the Apollo, which has happened recently. So what we have done, we are just do the endoscopy. It showed even as a common ulceration here. But the entire use of is to be absolutely normal. See, whatever is happening here doesn't mean the patient is having the same presentation in the esophagus. We need to do endoscopy but under caution. Thank Your you. Your chances sir. of perforation is high. Henry? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I request Dr. Sagarani and Ms. Ma'am to honor our speaker. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Let us next.